every single time I progress the slide when I'm not supposed to, we're not done yet. Um, so we'll give it just another minute before we'll get started uh, with our conversation today with the fantastic and fabulous Katie Mooney. I say fantastic, fabulous, ferocious, I find all the words that I could come up with to, to describe Katie Mooney. So um, as, as Liz mentioned a couple, a couple moments ago, uh, you know, if you're here for the first time, welcome. We're glad to have you. If you're coming back, thank you for coming back. We're so glad to have you. Feel free to share in the chat, uh, say hi, share what you do, who you are, where you're, where you're joining us from. If you have, uh, if you want to share your LinkedIn links, if you have events that you're hosting that you want to share with others, you know, we're all, we're all in this together. So please feel free to share. Um, and uh, this is, you know, as, as Liz mentioned, this is a community and we want to help everyone um, continue to come together. Actually, I think, you know, Katie is the reason that Liz and I even know each other uh, because they originally met and then Katie connected Liz with Jennifer and then Jennifer connected her with me. And then, so it's, uh, you know, we all, we all come together through our, our networks. I love this. Okay, let's see, what time is it? 3.03, I think we're good. So I'm gonna stop sharing and we'll get started. Well, happy Wednesday, everyone. Welcome to the final episode of Hope, Heart, and the Human Spirit. I still can't believe that three months ago I started this journey and launched Hummingbird Humanity and we've now had 14 episodes uh, and so many great conversations and it could, I couldn't be happier that Katie Mooney is, is the, the guest for our final episode. She has actually meant, she's meant a lot to me in my journey as a DEI professional. Uh, when I started as a consultant, Katie actually gave me some great coaching and support because I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and, uh, and she was so incredibly supportive and also clear. And, not, and a lot of times when we're looking for feedback and coaching, we don't always get that. So Katie, thank you so much for all of the help you gave me. Um, I'm so glad that we could have this conversation. So before we dive in though, I wanna make sure I say, you know, for, particularly for those of you who are new um, to Hummingbird Humanity, I um, launched Hummingbird Humanity three months ago as a consulting firm to champion for human-centered workplace cultures. I have this belief that we have somewhere along the way lost our focus on the humans that work in our workplaces. And some might argue that we actually never got had that. Um, uh, but I, you know, what I found in this work in diversity and inclusion, so much of what we do is around how do we bring our humanity to the conversation and the decisions that companies are making? Uh, so, um, uh, so I have kindred spirits uh, in the DEI community, and there's also another community which is the purpose-driven community that, that focuses on conscious capitalism is one of those groups. So, um, so there's lots of us out there who are trying to make workplaces better for everyone. And uh, so that's what Hummingbird Humanity is all about. Uh, right now we're really focusing on stories and the Hope, Heart, and Human Spirit series is an opportunity for us to meet some really amazing people who are doing um, doing great work to make a, make a, make a difference and change how companies operate, and also who have their own unique individual stories, uh, and they're they're um, and they they bring their lived experiences with them to the work they do. Uh, so Katie is one of those people that I said we all have to hear from her, and um, I'm glad that she's with us today. So Katie, welcome. Um, before we dive into the conversation, I'll let you say you probably have some words of welcome or things you want to you want to mention before we get started. Well, Brian, thanks so much for um, having me join. And it's so, again, to your point, thrilling to be with you and Liz again. Um, just love, of course, how incredible the DEI community is, the, our networks. And um, as I've seen in some chat, so good to see some familiar names and wish I could see all of your faces. But I really hope for this conversation that we're really going to be able to, you know, share some thoughts, be really real and transparent. Transparent. I don't think I know any other way to be when talking about especially something so important like our diversity, equity, and inclusion right now. Um, and uh, I really looking. I really, really look forward to uh, continuing on in this. Awesome. Thanks, Katie. And uh, last but not least for our introductions is the fantastic Liz Roy. Liz, do you want? I'll let you. Do you want to say hi? 
Hi, yes. Um, I'm so thrilled to be on this call uh, because Katie is part of the reason why I'm at my uh, current organization, Jennifer Brown Consulting, where I work as the Director of Business Development, and she's also one of the reasons I got connected with Brian. And so really excited for this conversation, and I'm really excited to uh, connect with everyone on this call, too. Please do utilize the chat to send questions that you want to ask. I will be monitoring it regularly to make sure that we address any questions that come through. Awesome, thanks Liz. Thank yeah, and you know, it's, um, you know, one of the things that, Jen, that Liz and I were talking, Liz, I'm gonna start over. One of the things that Katie and I were talking about yesterday as we were having our prep call is just acknowledging how Jennifer has opened doors for all of us. Um, and, uh, and I know Jennifer has been so kind to me and opened doors and that's how I know Katie and that's how, the reason I know Liz. Uh, and you know, it's, it's, it's wonderful to see, one of the things we talk about in our work is the importance of, uh, of opening doors for others. And I think Jennifer is one of those individuals who consistently opens doors for others. So, you know, Liz, I know we're, we're talking about Jennifer Brown. Would you do me a favor and throw Jennifer's LinkedIn link in the chat and the Jennifer Brown Consulting link? Let's just acknowledge them since we're, since we're talking about them. And if you're not following Jennifer Brown, follow Jennifer Brown. There's always great information there. But let's talk about Katie. That's who we're here to talk about. So Katie, you and actually, I didn't even know your full story of just of, of, of as a as just a person. But outside of the work that you that you do, of course, I've had a chance to meet your husband or your partner. Um, so I know I've known a little bit about you. But would you share with all of us this really fascinating story you have? Sure. I, I mean, I think it nicely sets up why naturally I look years later of why I ended up in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space. But um, yeah, so thrilled to be here, Katie Mooney. She, her, I am. Um, I am a child of two white parents. So I was a Korean adoptee in the 80s. I um, was raised in a, I would say, a really honestly quintessential childhood in a suburb in Seattle where it was extremely safe where we were given resources when we need them. We didn't know about um, you know, obviously pieces of our own cultural heritage or identity. And I think about that a lot as being a child of two white parents in really trying to understand not only the neighborhood and the children I played with and grew up with, understanding that they being predominantly white um, and their experience were not, were also shared experiences of my own. But then what's interesting is, and I have a Korean adopted sister. I mean, we don't call each other my Korean adopted sister, but uh, she is not biologically related to me and she is a Korean American woman. And so, um, you know, our family was already diverse. And then when we were, I was five, um, my dad came out and shared that he was gay and that completely changed our family dynamic. And we went from, you know, now two households and, you know, we had an admittedly so a few uncles at the time and um, just kind of really learning about my dad and his identity and who he was becoming in the world but what was interesting in the 80s is that we were not in the space we are today related to any and much to do still in that space um, it's really interesting because what we ended up doing was establishing a real normalcy in our household. Being My father being gay was not abnormal until I went to school, where then a little girl could no longer come over to my house and spend the night because, you know, I had a gay parent. And so those were part of the things that made it really interesting. Um, and so what we ended up doing as a family a little bit, my dad was in education, higher education. So there was a certain stigma about, you know, educators, gay men working with children. And it was a really um, interesting time in which we all essentially went back into the closet. And so um, I spent a lot of my childhood trying to unpack that a little bit more as, as you know, I was protecting him. You know, it was sharing that that was just my uncle um, when 
people would question me or really working to assimilate that we were a relatively normal family. And we were always very proud of the fact that, you know, my dad and his partner I truly were part of what helped us be so successful um, to this day. But it was also a really interesting time when, of course, you know, LGBTQ partnerships and having children was definitely not what we're seeing today and um, as being part of the norm. And then finally, as you kind of intersectionally throw in, an, um, you know, additional twists, I, you know, grew up again with a very kind of normalized American childhood. And what was interesting for me is then now visually here I am as a young adult in the workplace now seeing different ways in which I am being stereotyped against, whether I'm being passed up specifically for a promotion. And it was this weird piece in my mind where I was, you know, told I could be anything I wanted to be, but then in the workplace, it was like, nope, not, not yet, not, you're not quite ready for that yet. And so that was my visible identity, really kind of coming into the fourfold. And then, and then finally, with my own um, relationship, I, I married a Korean Black uh, man, and he has a really rich experience in both very um, Korean culture and also um, a very Black culture with his family. And so I have had now a traditional Korean mother all of a sudden a little bit later in life. And it's been so amazing to see this because, you know, we talk about not only, you know, us assimilating as the model minority, but my mom mother-in-law, she has worked so hard her entire life as an immigrant, and she is not given the same privileges that I've been afforded to of, as, you know, being, you know, Asian. So it's a really interesting mix as I continue to grow of um, not only my identities and what has made me um, who I am, but also just, of course, who I'm continuing to become. And, you know, it's a really interesting time with COVID-19 and, of course, the racial and social injustices. So, I mean, it really is a further exploration of myself every single day. I love it. I, I don't think I knew that you had a gay dad. I love that. I think that's just so awesome. Uh, but I also appreciate you sharing the stories of what that was like as a, as a kid um, and, um, and some of the challenges that you face, which, which I know kids today still face. Uh, right. and we, we still have work to do uh, as far as yeah. we know. I was, I was thinking about this last night of, um, you know, and you've, you've mentioned to it that, you know, you have this intersectionality in your life of, uh, the, 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 the black community, the Asian community, which is diverse in, in itself as is the black community. Um, let's, can, could you share a little bit about how, you know, how you've experienced the, the pandemic and some of what happened to the Asian, Asian community, um, the, the racism towards that community as a result of thinking that the virus is the Chinese virus. Um, and then also, you know, as, you, as you're talking, as this, you know, I think there's, there's an intersection there of Black Lives Matter has resurged as a very important conversation. It's not a new conversation, but it's very important and we have a lot of momentum. And, and I, I just am curious how that's played out for you and your family. Yes, sure. So for me, um, you know, the COVID-19, the you know, Chinese virus, Kung flu, it's just, it's laughable, but it's, it's what's not laughable is that I think as of to date, we're about 1900 reports of physical and verbal attacks against Asian Americans. And we're continuing to see that racist, xenophobic act that's continuing to happen. Um, and it happened so quickly, which is really interesting because it has to be then related to a common set of stereotypes or rhetoric or narrative um, about how Asians are disease carriers, how they are dangerous foreigners to this country. Those stereotypes have to come into play with how quickly assaults against Asian Americans can be rapidly propelled against one another. And so, um, you know, regardless however long you've been in this country and your citizenship status perhaps, Asians are still being regarded as being from the Far East, 
and particularly recognized as Chinese. I always get, am I Chinese, Japanese? And then the might get to the actual truth of, of me being Korean as, as I may be like, you know, option C or D. And so these are the stereotypes that are kind of lingering here. And, um, you know, it's like only in Asia are we seeing from the media images of Asian people that possibly live in poor unsanitary conditions or eat the strange things like the, you know, we've seen people talk about rats and mice and Asian people eat bats. So then it's only makes sense that to, into some people, these stereotypes might in fact be true and Asians are going to be these disease carriers. So it's a very dangerous rhetoric and the stereotypes that exist against Asian Americans. And, you know, I sit here and think, well, that's only going to happen, you know, of course, in small town America. But that's not so true. My husband and I were walking down Melrose at the beginning of the pandemic with our masks on and we're walking single file and a gentleman had come and verbally assaulted my husband and he just told me to keep walking and we were ended up being safe and secure I know folks have not had that same um, experience of like this is Melrose and in Los Angeles, California, and this is happening during COVID. So we're still the victims of this. And what's scary about when we reopen the economy, truly, Brian, is that we're going to continue to see perhaps this divisiveness. Um, we saw with 9-11 the Muslim, Sikh, and um, Arab communities, you know, they were really the victims of this backlash that continued to happen, and for over 10 years. And so it wasn't just the additional, obviously, the hate crimes that were, you know, that had happened, but it was also the changes to these policies that were created, changes to immigration policies, changes to surveillance of people. And so as we continue onward, I unfortunately, um, thinking about the impacts of COVID-19 for years to come for the Asian community. And then if I segue into Black Lives Matters, you know, it absolutely most certainly does. Nothing has been more um, of a real truth for me in terms of my activism, but also because this impacts my family. Um, and, you know, especially when I think about specifically my husband and his family and the experiences of being profiled continuously. And also even just, you know, being told that you are less than. And so those are really real things that continue to live and be in such proximity, very close to me. So Black Lives Matters is in proximity to me as much as to my Asian identity that COVID-19 assault was on Melrose in LA. So, you know, very real prominent things happening based off of our identities. Yeah, you know, the, um, this is this is real for me as as well, and and I think that you know it's it's surprising when people realize that these st things get said to us when we're still walking down the street. Like I, I don't, you've met me, Katie. You know I'm six foot six. I'm not a small person, um, and so I don't worry about my safety. Um, but I, I was on a thread the other day on Facebook where. Um, where someone said, when was the last time, and this was a gay man who said, it was the last time that, that someone called you a derogatory gay term, which begins with the F word, uh, or the F letter, and um, I don't like to say it, so um, you, I'll let everyone fill in the blank. And I'm like, oh, it was just this past fall when I was a block of my apartment in New York City. Um, and you know, New York City is considered a safe place for, for, for gay people, um, but even there, like that, those things happen. And you were in LA, another place that is considered a very international city um, that is very diverse. Um, so even in those places, those moments still happen. Um, and which is a big reason why we do what we do. Um, before we talk about the work, I, one thing that I, I know you helped me with this conversation of some of the ways of thinking about the, we tend, we lump together the Asian community either in one or two phrases typically in the United States, the Asian community or the Asian and Pacific Islander community. Yeah. 
it is an incredibly diverse, broad set of countries, and, and we don't have enough time to cover it all. Um, but for those of us that are, are here to learn, what, what are some of the things you might just encourage us to do to understand the diversity of Asia? Mm. Yeah, great question. You know, I think it's important to remember that Asian is a racial category in the United States. It, it's not ethnic, it's not a geographic category, although we like to think so. And, um, but according to the US Census, it is absolutely inclusive, for example, of the entire Indian subcontinent. Um, and so, you know, when we think about Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal. So those are all part of the Asian community, inclusive of the Far East and South Asian communities. Um, you know, Thailand, Vietnam, Philippines, Korea, Japan, et cetera. And so it's a, it's, it's a little limiting to not also acknowledge those additional identities. I think when somebody says like justice, Supreme Court, Justice Sonia Sotomayor, she, she is the first Puerto Rican Supreme Court Justice. That is true, but she is also the first Hispanic or Latinx Supreme Court Justice. So really naming it is really important when we think about that. And, um, you know, one of my favorite books is actually by Erica Lee, an educator on the making of Asian Americans. It's a really rich history of our Asian American history in the United States and um, a great actual documentary that she did for PBS most recently. And um, it's interesting because what she shares about the Asian American community that's really complex, and I talked about it a little bit earlier with my, my own identity and my mother, but you know, we've got this Asian community that's very highly successful, very visible, been represented in politics, sports, um, even sports, you know, athletes, for example, and you know, managers, and we've got people that are really successful. They've been able to assimilate, they've been able to become this model minority in our society. But what's interesting, interesting is on the opposite end of that spectrum, we have folks that are immigrants, still learning the language, really on the kind of outward ends of the spectrum where they are not able to get the same advantages and benefits. And what happens is as a culture, we try to like fit and mold folks together like we're one uh, because it's easy for us to do. It's easy to, to share a story that is similar and same and it makes logical sense, but we still really have to acknowledge that this position of power still has different implications for many of us as Asian Americans. And so whether we are, you know, in corporate America and are the senior leaders, our microaggressions and biases that we experience are going to be so different than, of course, what others are experiencing when they are truly seen as foreigners or as outsiders to this country. And so it's really important, I think, for us as we continue with our own story in society that we are continuing to acknowledge the true diversity of the Asian American community. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and um... One other thing that I, I wanted to, I remembered I wanted to mention a couple minutes ago as you were talking about some of the ways um, that I'll say media in the United States has portrayed um, the Asian community broadly and individually have, have not been images that I feel like represent the beauty of that, of those, those cultures in, in many ways. And I remember when I went to China a couple years ago, um, uh, and I, I was a little nervous because all the things I'd seen and heard gave me this perspective of what it might be like. It could not have been farther from that reality. Uh, and, and it now makes me, I want to go and I want to visit Korea and I want to visit Japan and I want to visit some of the, the Southeastern Asian countries, which you know, some of my friends have been to and, and have sent me beautiful pictures from. So you know, it, it's given me this other perspective of, Hey, not everything that we see in the media is always the the truth, <laughs> um, as uh, as you know, as I think many of us have learned, and particularly, unfortunately, in recent recent months and years, 
uh, there's, there's, uh, there's always more to the story. Uh, so I appreciate you helping to sort of encourage us to think like there is more to that story, even just behind the word Asian, there's much more to that story as well. Right. So let's talk about the work, um, which I'm sure we'll come back to some of this as well, because it all come, it all intersects, of course. Together. Mm -hmm. So you work for Diversity Best Practices, which I think is such a cool name. And I'm always like, what does Diversity practice, Best Practices do? So I know a little bit more than maybe some others on the call, but can you tell us what that means, what they do? <laughs> sure, sure. So Diversity Best Practices, or I'll probably reference it as DBP, is a division of Working Mother Media. And so it offers mid to large size organizations um, and their diversity leadership teams, chief diversity officers, or their entire DNI team, just tools to implement DNI programming. And um, Oh, it's interesting because it infuses in the insights of other companies. So the best practices or what we're even calling the next practices of other organizations and um, ensuring that we're all not reinventing the wheel. But what I love about diversity best practices related to the events and community is that, you know, there is a quarterly best practices member conference. There is an Emerge, which is a ERG conference for leadership development. So really giving opportunities for ERG leaders to come meet and um, share best practices. We just finished our National Multicultural Women's Conference. Um, and a couple of events that I'm really looking forward to in the coming uh, year is, a, is gonna be our Work Beyond Summit. And then I'm looking forward to our All In for Women in Technology. So just again, these really, really Rich ways for you know our members and other folks in the DNI community to come together and of course learn from each other. What also is interesting about diversity best practices is we actually partner with our sister, the Working Mother Research Institute. And we deploy an annual inclusion index, which organizations will um, fill out an application, they will submit to the index, and they're going to be evaluated based off of their, DB, their DEI priorities. And it's really um, scores and the scores and calculations of this score is really based on best practices as it relates to recruitment and retention in advancement and just also, of course, accountability, where your um, leadership's fall related, leadership falls related to their commitment to diversity and inclusion. Um, and then also just how are we currently developing underrepresented minorities, LGBTQ, disability, et cetera. So it is really a composite score that comes together, which rates different organizations on their and applaud them truly for their best practices in this work. And what we've seen for the 2020 index, which is going to be released in August, is not only an uptick in the amount of companies that are submitting to the index, but what we're seeing is that that is because of true accountability and that being a requirement. So we're seeing that be a requirement not only from leadership teams, but we're actually seeing this from the external environment, extremely around investors. Investors are really interested in diversity and inclusion efforts, which is, you know, newer. And then, of course, the, you know, communities in which we serve. Customers can spend their dollar and they have a choice in that. So they're going to be really intentional about spending their dollar in a place that looks like them. And so we're going to continue to see as we think about future indices going forward, I think we're going to transparency is going to be a huge theme and accountability um, for related to the index. And so my work specifically uh, today is I work with 51 and probably some change of member organizations from the West Coast around to Minneapolis, really advising um, different organizations across industry from as big as the Fortune One, of course, into the 1000 predominantly when I talk about organizations specifically. Um, and so working every single day with them on um, helping them from an advisory perspective on the work they're doing to advance inclusion. And I'm just really proud of some of the work that, you know, the organizations are doing. We're seeing a lot of emphasis, at least now, on, you know, the importance of building these global DEI councils, things that are sustainable, not only to support the corporate structure, to support the DEI strategy and keeping that very 
very sound. But then ensuring that you have those kind of regional or local uh, complexities that come into the equation that we're thinking about and solving for that as well. So I'm really um, seeing a lot of organizations get really uh, clear on the formation of their de global DEI councils and what that looks like to manage a big board. Um, and then I think also too, um, what I'm really excited of is seeing um, more companies are gonna are making accountability statements by way of representation. So really excited to see these really aggressive uh, data around we are going to by 2030 hit this metric and it's really impressive to see that and not only is it an honor to be with them and share and how we're developing and supporting them and developing that strategy but we're also being really realistic with respect to even right now with the pandemic I've said to some of these organizations now remember if schools close your progress towards women and advancement of women in leadership is going to have real impact depending on what happens as we every single day watch the schools. And, you know, I really hope women aren't going to leave the workplace, but again, without a schedule, without a alternative opportunities in our organizations that we as DEI practitioners have to really try to solve for and advocate for, we need to be thinking about that workplace of the future. So while we're working on the now, we're also really working on the future and trying to reimagine it, quite frankly. And um, I think that that's really important related to some of the things I'm seeing uh, member organizations doing right now. Well, Katie, I have two quick questions from uh, oh. Justin. Was okay. that what you were gonna say, Brian? No, go ahead, go ahead, Liz. <laughs> oh, so awesome. Uh, Justin asks, what does DB DBP consider mid to large size companies? And also, uh, do you have visibility on how those 2030 targets are being set? Because uh, his organization is setting theirs now. Great. Um, so related to the size of memberships, typically they are going to be, um, you know, I think as organization size usually is about kind of in the 1500 all the way to the 100 plus thousand of employees. Um, I think that when I have think about my West Coast uh, group, I think about, you know, Microsoft, uh, Facebook, a lot of the technology companies that are part of DBP. I think about, um, you know, some of the great companies in technology, Western Digital, for example, working with them, Hillrom doing incredible um, medical device equipment um, in the Midwest. So just, again, really across industries. Um, but the, it's a membership for organizations, if that helps to answer your questions. And then I think about when, what's interesting, Justin, is that many of our DEI officers are getting their board that are kind of looking and saying, this is the goal. And so it really is kind of this, um, it's really when advocacy can happen when we're really kind of working as leadership to talk to our board and our CEOs and the C-suite really kind of saying, you know, 30%, for example, Facebook just um, said they are going to uh, publicly declare 30% of minorities, underrepresented minorities and talent in their leadership ranks. And they were very, very um, direct on that and they're working on you know what does that look like to build that strategy but i think as a diversity and inclusion advocate we have the job of saying what does this really take what does this look like in terms of creating metrics around how we are going to continue to advance and progress against those metrics um and important also knowing that this has got to be a goal that is longer than it is going to be short because um you know when we're thinking about these really aggressive goals that people are setting which is all for the good i'm really thankful that we are actually seeing leadership call it out We've got to be really thinking about our time box and ensuring that what we're going to do is realistic and that we can truly measure it. Yeah. And, and if Justin and for others, what, if I could offer, there's a couple of things that I'd, I'd love to offer. One is, um, and I, I, I believe that uh, taking surveys or um, assessments like the one that Katie described um, are an essential component of doing this work. Uh, and uh, and you know there's the, there's the uh, women in the workplace study from McKinsey. Uh, there's of course the work that is done by HRC um, uh, for 
a name is escaping me. But what is it? What is the HRC label? What you get when you um, corporate equality index? Corporate equality index. Thank you. It just left my mind. The corporate. Thank you, Justin. You know, so I think those are great ways to to measure. And what I found is. Um, with with those the insights there, it was helpful to, to be able to use that as benchmarking information for conversations I was having with my leadership team. So many of you may be doing that already, but if you're not, I would definitely encourage it. Um, you know, and, and on the question of of setting goals, one thing that I I found really important when we were having these conversations at Tapestry was let's have a let's have a conversation about how this connects to our business strategy and how the importance of representation comes into play into that business strategy. So we, we would talk a lot about the customer demographics uh, and the population of the demographics, the, dem the demographics of our population in our retail stores and how we needed leadership that would reflect the evolution of our customer population as well as the people that work in our stores every day. Um, and, and so those, if you go to Tapestry's uh, uh, CSR site, you can see those goals, they're public out there, everyone can see them, they're, the updates are published each year. And, uh, and I think that public transparency and commitment is really important as well, which I'm sure is what Katie's already advocating that those companies are doing, um, hopefully as well. Yes, absolutely. But we still acknowledge there's challenges. I spoke with a member today and they said our legal department is saying, no, we are not going to, you know, go public. Let's just use our good faith effort, I think was what they said. And it was like, well, the good faith effort is not what is going to get us into what we're really looking to accomplish. And so the barriers can be even internally um, within and, and really as DEI practitioners, we have this responsibility to try to work with, you know, advocating and being ambassadors for, of course, you know, the right thing truly in this space. Yeah. Well, and, and I know one of the, um, you, you mentioned the ERG summit, Emerge, is that what it's called? Is that right? Yes. Yes. I remember when you talked to me about this, I think it was in May, we had a conversation. I'm like, what is this magic thing you're talking about? Um, and I, you know, I, many of us will know that employee resource groups have gone through this evolution from being uh, talked about as affinity groups um, or even social clubs <laughs> uh, to employee resource groups to now be business resource groups. Um, and I, I sort of, and when I have conversations with people, I'm like, here's the thing. I'm, I'm not going to go to the BRG nomenclature. I'm going to stay with ERGs. But the intent behind BRGs, I know, is really important, is connecting it to business activities. Um, what, are you, what are the things that you're seeing um, with ERGs that are connecting the work with business activities or, or really connecting with conversations that are happening in the marketplace as well? Yeah, so I think what's really important is ERGs are truly, I mean, the, like, heart of the organization with respect to building community and employee engagement. All of those things very much matter and where the ERGs um, are just really not acknowledged enough. I often say they are actually true lines of business if you think about the way in which they're organized with a senior account uh, or a senior executive or a sponsor, and then they've got a budget and they're going to be a, involved in some of the programmatic efforts. So I often say they actually are like running a line of business, like, you know, having your first stab at a P&L role. And so give that a try, you know, really leap forward into that space of managing an employee resource group. And I think we all know and acknowledge not only the importance of what they play to the organization, but of course, the value proposition exposure for a, a emerging ERG leader to really build a lot of skill sets and competencies. So I think what we're seeing as what we've been also been encouraging um, our members is to be thinking about this tapped resource of talent, an ERG leader, and how can we help to kind of translate those skill sets that they've learned in the employee resource group into certain roles. That's absolutely like the low hanging fruit, like win, easy win, to really create a development pathway for employee resource group leaders. But also, as we think about this um, conversation around not 
you know, not paying diversity and inclusion practitioners. I often am starting to ask, why aren't we paying employee resource group leaders? Why aren't we compensating them for the work that they're able to do? And to Brian, your point, what they're able to bring to the business. And so I think we're going to see a lot more um, from our members around we want the representative voices we want the experts but we've got to as a business acknowledge this and so often as many of us know they're doing that side of desk work we need to create space and so i've seen a couple of compensation activities from some member companies um you know jp morgan they actually have i believe a star program where basically you can peer nominate they offer up to $500 per quarter and you can nominate different employee resource group leaders and they award, I think, 25 a quarter or something to that. And he's thrown into a bigger pool for a all-inclusive trip um, and they'll award certain people, leaders for their work there. So, you know, not only the monetary awards, but the experiences. And they, you know, they get to fly with a guest to New York City. And so it's just a really nice way to recognize ERG leaders for their work. Um, I think we're also seeing um, at Merrill Lynch, for example, where they are awarding based off of, you know, nomination, self-nomination and awards. We're seeing $10,000 being acknowledged um, to ERG leaders in some cases, and we're seeing even $20,000 being awarded to their executive sponsor, but for a charity of their choice. So just seeing different monetary rewards, I think are going to be huge for going forward. And I think the business is really waking up to this. Um, and then finally, I think also too related to, um, what we're seeing with the RGs right now because of COVID and because of the social injustice and just the things that are very timely right now and centered in our heart and our minds, the ERGs are so vital right now during times of disruption and crisis because as leaders, they are going to be your intel into what's going on in the organization. How are people feeling? What are the needs and services that we need to be providing our employees right now? They are just available. They there to you. Um, and that's really important right now. But I also want to share that they're also not there in some cases to do the work for the organization. Some of, uh, you know, when I think about our colleagues in the Black resource groups, you know, they've been, you know, victims of this racial injustice for 400 years. And so, you know, these, this is nothing new. So I think, you know, it is this mix of, you know, I think we know we've got to do our own work in this conversation, but we really can utilize our resource groups when and where they matter. I think we just as leaders, especially as practitioners have to protect them and, um, you know, be able to kind of advocate for them as they're going to have, you know, specific needs as well. Thanks, Katie. I, 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 love, I love the thinking about are there creative ways to also um, reward those leaders uh, with, you know, through nominations or through the ability for them to make uh, choices around where they're going to donate to the communities. Uh, you know, I think there's some really, there's some really exciting evolutions there. Um, you know, and one uh, one thing I just wanted to offer for those those of you listening that I loved um, that we I was able to do a tapestry with the teams there is the the Pride ERG um, worked with Coach on uh, on two different efforts over the last couple of years. Um, last year was the biggest of those two, where they worked with the Coach ERG on their Pride capsule, um, and because they they wanted Coach wanted to make sure that the Pride capsule was going to resonate with the LGBTQ plus community, so they actually shared the product designs, which people don't get to see, but they they got to they shared their product designs and said, well, how does this resonate with you or not resonate with you? Are there questions it raises? Uh, and uh, and I that, I thought that was fantastic. And then it was the same with the um, with the Pride campaign Coach did last year was they actually included the ERG group in developing that campaign. 
Yeah. And I, you know, it made me think of also too, how important ERGs are not only to the customer and to solve for those, the, that innovation, but also the community. And um, I was just so proud to be able to hear from Allstate and their Asian ERG, and then a combination of their intrapreneurs, I believe is what they call them. They're kind of an entrepreneur like ERG inside of Allstate. But what they did in COVID was they went actually out and offered their services to the Asian community to help translate to English um, some of the applications for the PPP loans. As we know that a lot of, um, you know, Asian minorities, for example, own small businesses. And so they went out into their local community to really help create um, tools and resources for minority owned businesses in their community. And so I just thought that that is the power, not only of an organization and what we're able to solve for, but also the power of the employee resource group in your community. So um, just a really great, honestly, next practice from Allstate. I love that. I love that. Thank you, Katie. Um, I have one more question for you. And then uh, Liz has already pinged me to say that there's some already some great questions that are pending. So we'll get okay. to those, I promise. Uh, <laughs> others have questions, feel free to put them in chat or Q&A, and we'll get to as many questions as we can, of course. Um, so the last thing I want to make sure I ask you about, and I, I know that others are going to love hearing about this, what is this magical thing, uh, magical is my word of the day, this magical thing you're doing with a new approach to focus groups, um, mm. you know, it's, and it's so important to get information and also in this space also to get anonymous information, but it, it's always imperfect. So what are you doing and what are you, how is that proving beneficial to the clients you're working with? Yeah, so this is um, a, again, a sister organization that we have under our kind of working mother media umbrella is Culture at Work. They're our kind of bespoke consulting firm. And they have created what we call an employee voice session, or maybe I'll refer to it as an EVS. And so what they've done is they've taken the power of focus groups, mixing them with quantitative and qualitative data, um, alongside with interview methodologies to really um, gener generate and combine to create uh, insights, quite frankly, into employee sentiment, into employee experiences. And so if, for example, I'll use the three of us on a call, if you and I were going to use the software, we would log into the system. I'd be Katie Mooney, you'd be Brian McCormick and Liz Roy. But when we get into the session, we would actually be given another name. So we would be a non, one, two, three, and maybe Brian, you'd be a non, six, five, eight, and Liz would be a non, two, four, six, whatever the case is. So we would actually then chat in a chat functionality and spend the entire 60 to 90 minute session as our anon profile and be sharing our sentiments via chat text and type and so what i find as somebody that has facilitated focus groups in the past you know it's recording it's trying to write down everything or it's trying to get an exceptional note taker to ensure that they heard you well but inside of this tool we're actually getting the raw data um, right then and there. And then we're actually able to ask some data up front around, you know, demographics, maybe it's gender, maybe it's um, race, LGBTQ, for example. And so we're actually able to share sentiments based off of some demographic data, but again, it's in an anonymous fashion. And so you might be typing your sentiment on something and a non-145 is your CEO. You may never know that. Um, and that is the, you know, kind of beauty of preserving the anonymity for these really, really rich conversations. And what I'm finding is a big difference between in focus and in person focus groups, which are very, very powerful. But I have been in rooms where you'll ask a riveting question and people will kind of glance around the room to see who's going to really say it and who's going to be the person that is going to be brave enough. And in this environment, you are your anon profile and so you can answer those sentiments as you wish um and so what's interesting as well is after the murder of george floyd and many of others organizations really wanted to hear from their colleagues what were they needing right now and so we developed these race-based conversations 
conversations, utilizing this platform where anonymously people could come in to the chat room essentially and be asked questions. And so, for example, we might ask questions really related to the individual around how have the current events affected you? And people would begin to, to talk about things. Maybe we'd ask some then questions moving on about the organization. What measures have you seen taken by your organization or your CEO that have been effective and impacted you right now? And then what us as practitioners get really excited about is what do you need right now? And so, you know, you can imagine from a repos, uh, you know, a repos or an aggregate of all the data, you know, DNI practitioners get this beautiful report and they're just going to town, of course, about what are true solutions that they really need. And it's really been meaningful conversation. And what I've found is a few observations I'd love to share a little bit about specifically these race based conversations. But what I'm finding is that overwhelmingly respondents do share that they feel it is extremely important for companies to address issues of racism. So now we're seeing, of course, where home, life, work, it intersects, and that's really important to people. Um, we find that many people share that they feel really supported by their colleagues, they feel supported and by, in some cases, their managers, and it really is around proximity and trust, but people are having race conversations. We ask them, have you had a race-based conversation at work and with whom, and they will share who they've um, had conversations with and we find again proximity and closeness and trust um, are two very big variables of people still having the conversation so for us as practitioners we think we kind of don't want to go there well guess what they're already talking about it it's happening regardless of what we say um, We've even seen, of course, with the um, vulnerability and well, really the anonymity, we've seen people say, you know, the complete dissatisfaction that an employee will have against their company's statement or their CEO's action. I saw one yesterday to, where they said, our CEO is not authentic. I can feel it. And that is something that may question if I am going to continue working here. And that is a really live sentiment. And I don't know if that would be something that that person would have shared if we were all in person and without that, you know, an anonymity. Um, and I think also too, what's really a real thing for me every time I facilitate one of these sessions is that this is a really real topic. And again, lines are very blurred related to work and at home. And I um, have so much empathy for people that honestly answer and say, you know, I have children that are black and I have families who I am scared for every single day. How do you expect me to come to work right now and give everything I've got when I am worried about my child at home? Those are really real touch points for me. And so every single time people are really sharing experiences about what they're worried about. Maybe they're sharing where they have difference of opinions at home. We've heard a lot about that where I have one opinion, my family has another. I'm having such a struggle in talking with my family. That has been also really um, on the shoulders of all of us in this conversation. And, um, you know, again, also keeping it very real, I think people are also sharing, of course, their fear of retaliation. If I say this in my company, am I going to be the one that is rocking the boat? Am I going to be the one that's presumed to be, um, you know, too loud? Am I going to be, and we've even had the air quotes, that angry black woman yet again in my organization. And so that fear of retaliation has been very real. Um, and then, of course, just the feeling we actually name the feeling how are you feeling right now and we get you know obviously words just sad angry hopeless we're getting people who might even say white guilt um, folks that are saying I don't know what to do I don't know how to ally for others so it is again very real and then of course what we talked a little bit about earlier finally is that you know our black colleagues are tapped they're tired and so this is a way for them to express and say you know even though I'm a non one four five I'm a black woman don't ask me yeah well and uh, you're absolutely right our, our black colleagues are are tired um, and uh, and I, I continue to have moments of learning um, to understand what that what that exhaustion feels like, 
a mental, physical, emotional, and what we need from them and, and their experience in our country. Um, I'm glad the conversations are happening. I hope that change comes from that. Um, and that's, I think, a good, uh, I'll ask one of the questions in here. Amy, Amy Borgen asks, how do you overcome some of the barriers in your organization with an HR or executives when, when starting up DEI efforts? Um, and I know there's a couple things we've talked about already, like using surveys or using voice of employee data and information. Um, one of the other things that comes to mind for me, and you may have others, is our stats of, of helping them understand stats. And I know one of the things that you do um, at, uh, at DVP or one of your sister companies is um, you've mentioned a survey recently on multicultural women and like understanding like the impact that could have on your company if you're losing people. So, you know, maybe talk to us about what you think are some overcoming some of the barriers and share a little bit about what that survey learned. Yeah, so I think we know that pretty much people in DNI can often say, well, what is the business case? And that's really important to get there. But I also question to say, what happens if we don't? do this. And what we're finding, and I think Liz may have may share this with all of you, but recently DVP and Culture at Work, we just came out um, last week with our um, multicultural women's study. And we did this study with um, partnership and sponsorship from Capital One, Eli Lilly, Moody's, and um, Freddie Mac, I believe. And so what we're finding is that, for example, 50% of multicultural women are planning to leave the workforce in two years. That is a tidal wave of movement from women multicultural women inside of your organization. And if you think about the sunk cost of not only onboarding and bringing that person up to kind of their skill set and proficiency in which they're performing their single every jo their job every day, that is a scary statistic. Um, so I think it's really important that we're thinking about this you know, overall and holistically. And, you know, in the report, you'll read that there are two reasons why women are leaving and it is biases they face every single day. Um, basically walking into a room as a multicultural woman and you see my, you see my gender as a woman and you see me as an Asian woman then maybe you see my skill set. So of course, how is that going to impede me from being your top candidate and sponsorship. And then finally, we see um, for multicultural women, the lack of networks. And so the lack of sponsorships, the lack of white male colleagues. And so that's really telling not only in the way in which sponsorship and networks work, because we find that women two times are more likely to be engaged in their organization if they've got an access to a strong network. But the other finding of this study is that first Asian women, are the least likely to have sponsors. But then when multicultural women do go engage in sponsors, they'll often gain uh, sponsorship from their civic um, engagements, maybe their nonprofit boards. And so they'll go form those relationships, those deep relationships that are helping them to um, really, uh, again, progress in their career. But where the organization is losing is that the organization is actually losing them because that multicultural woman is now being recruited by an external company, from an external source, from a trusted partner to leave their organization and go out and do things on their own. Um, and so that's a really scary thing for an organization when you have a mentorship and a sponsorship program in place. We often say, who's participating in that? And who's been offered the opportunity to participate? Let's audit that, let's check that to be sure that we're not just giving away talent outside the door. Um, and then lastly, I'll finally say, um, you know, women, multicultural women, we're agile and we want to have our side hustles. We overwhelmingly have, um, more than white women have actual side hustles. And so, you know, we are going to continue to be the women that create businesses and small businesses as we're continuing to do so. I love that, Katie. Thank you. Um, I know we're at right top of the hour, so a couple people may need to drop off, and certainly we understand. I'm going to ask you two more quick, quick questions, Katie, if that's okay. Sure. I love that, and and because I want to make sure I get to what JD asked two questions, so I'm going to pick one of okay. JD's questions. Okay. He's asked, um, how can companies get involved in their local communities at a time when social distancing prevents that physical interaction between employees and communities? 
Any thoughts mm -hmm. on that? Great question. Well, I think specifically, and I just think ta really tactically, we're seeing a lot of ways to virtually volunteer and participate. So I think there's a couple of things we've seen, obviously, financial contributions, obviously, that's one way that you can advocate for your local community. But then we think about, um, for example, you know, people are starting to do, you know, the hiring for our hero, or uh, not hiring our heroes, the Operation Gratitude, that organization where people are putting their own kind of kits together for service members overseas. And so they're doing that within the safety of their own homes and then are able to mail out specifically those packages. So that can be actually a really cool volunteer opportunity for a virtual um, team to be able to participate in. And so that might be some of the tactical ways. Um, and then of course, you know, just related to, I think there's a lot to be said around ways in which we could all be lending our opportunity to help people with their resumes. Um, many people are facing a record unemployment, so we have this talent that we all have to not only help to help out with resumes virtually, be thinking about how we could do some virtual interviewing skills. That is a unique skill set. We normally could lean on interviewing when we went to the office and charm them personally. But, you know, building this kind of rigor inside of a Zoom room for especially a job is an art. And so how can we be thinking about giving back our time, our experiences, um, and um, perhaps volunteering in that way virtually, safely, and on Zoom? I love that. Such good ideas. Thank you, Katie. Well, I'm going to, I will, before, when we wrap up, I'll ask one personal question, but, um, because okay. I, I know there's one other question here that will, JD, will will connect with you offline. So you, so okay. Katie can help with that. Um, yes. but how do people find you? Sure. Um, sure. So yes, LinkedIn, Katie Ortley Mooney. Um, I think that would be fantastic. I absolutely can share, um, Liz and Brian both know how to reach me. And, um, you know, I think it's interesting because um, for those practitioners that are joining that are new to the space and thinking about their role in this work, you inspire me because we need more people in this space. If we had enough and this, this you know, industry was saturated enough, we would have equity. We would have, you know, solve for so many of the things that we're all still solving for and we need you in this conversation. So I am always open by way of community of not only lending my ear, my voice, any ways I can be an advocate or help to sponsor. It was an honest privilege because I jumped into this work knowing that I was going to try, Brian, I think like you, we similarly agree, in doing our best to make this world better. But I want to pass that baton. I will have to eventually. And I'm so inspired by you know, future practitioners in this space, the people that we're going to pass the baton to, because I am confident that you're going to take it and take the work we've done that we're doing today and advance it so much further forward. And so for me, in terms of the community and the give back, if I can be of service to any future practitioner in that way, I am all ears. I am open. I've got 30 minute time slots and happy to lend um, my expertise and my voice where I can. Absolutely. Well, and, and I will join you in that, Katie. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I want to make the world a better place. And I also want to give back. Uh, you know, I have, you know, people like you and others have helped me on my journey. And I, I you know, even at this point in my career, which I've been in for longer than I want to name out loud, so we don't talk about how old I am. Um, but, uh, but you know, th there is another generation, and uh, and whatever I can do to be of, be of help, I will I will absolutely join you in that. So feel free to reach out to to either Katie or I or both of us if you if you so right. so inclined. Um, Katie, as we wrap up, I, I always like to end on just a, a personal note. Okay. What brings you joy? Oh gosh, what brings me joy? Well, again, I think it is um, truly this movement of, um, you know, career wise and for my community, I think this movement of young people out in the streets, out in the communities, um, advocating for what they believe in, whether you agree with it or not, the joy is truly that our voice and what I'm seeing is beautiful intersectional, um, you know, people of different genders and of different color, just really coming together to advocate 
for what they believe in. And for me, and just related to joy, like that is something very bright for me. And again, as I kind of true back to that earlier comment, that that's why I'm here really is to help advance that, that joy that you all are spreading to the world. Um, but personal joy, I will say, you know, truly and kind of keeping it kind of fun. My nephews are my absolute joy. They are far from me right now in Seattle. I normally get to be with them much more than I, um, I am now. And they're, you know, about three and four. And so they're just exploring the world. And I'm so thankful they don't really know what COVID is. They think this mask thing is a superhero thing. So I'm really happy about that for them as they kind of try to establish what I guess their normal childhood looks like. But for pure joy, they um, got into a FedEx box last weekend. My sister video recorded this and they wanted to ship themselves down to see me uh, where I'm based in, in LA today. So, I mean, the pure joy I have in that is just um, the delight. But of course, Brian, Liz, that's why we do this work. It's for them. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's so sweet. I have to, I have to see this video. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, Katie, um, I'm going to put up a slide here real quick. Um, I wanted to say, you know, first of all, Katie, to you, thank you for joining me for the, the final episode of this wonderful series. Congratulations. Um, it, thank you so much. It could not have ended on a better note, so I'm so glad that you were with us. Uh, Liz, uh, thank you. Uh, I, and I don't think Angelo's here with us today, so Angelo helped uh, for the first about half of the series and then Liz picked up um, halfway through and Liz Thank you so much for your your partnership and for helping bring this to life each week. I'm so grateful Oh, truly my pleasure, Brian. Thank you for having me. This conversation has been fantastic highlight of my day So it's a joy truly love it. Thank I love you. It. Thanks Liz <laughs> And for all of you who are tuning in, I know we, we had a few people drop off because I just didn't want it to end. So I'm like, I have to keep going a few minutes past the hour. Um, and, and we were learning so much from you, Katie. So I'm, I appreciate you staying a few minutes after. So, so, much good, so much good wisdom. So I just want to say thank you, everyone, for joining, for being part of this journey. Um, it's, really, it's really been an honor to, to, to share this time with you over the last three months as we've gone through the pandemic together, and we still are. Um, I'm sure there will be more things to come from Hummingbird Humanity. Uh, Liz and Katie, I'm sure we'll have other opportunities to collaborate. Um, and all of you, feel, feel free to reach out to me or to Liz or to Katie, any of us, we're all here to help. Um, so I wish you all well, stay safe, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye everyone. Thanks everyone.